Hello, good evening. Welcome to News at 10 live from our studios at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. Uh, remember that we're also live on Facebook, streaming live on our Facebook page and on 3news.com. Let's start with the major news highlights of the day. The Office of the Special Prosecutor has invited suspended CEO of the Public Procurement Authority, Ejinim Boating AJ, after preliminary investigations into an alleged public procurement more practices. This follows President de Kufuado's letter, which directed his suspension and subsequent referral of the case to Shraj and the Special Prosecutor. Former President John Dramani Mahama is demanding that government makes public the shareholders of the Ghana Amalgamated Trust. He also described the Bank of Ghana's crackdown of the financial sector as a national security threat. And today, the Ghana Revenue Authority has revised the penalty for defaulters of the excise tax stamp from 100% to 200% of applicable taxes. The Chief Revenue Officer of the Excise Stamp Division, Kwabuna Apeu Ewa Anto, said during an enforcement exercise in Accra, said that defaulters will also be processed for court. Right, so those were our major news highlights. I remember we're streaming live on Facebook and on 3news.com. Uh, TV3 is also live on DSTV channel 279. Up next is the big one. Welcome back. Now, former President John Dramani Mahama is demanding that government makes public the shareholders of the Ghana Amalgamated Trust. He also described the Bank of Ghana's crackdown of the financial sector as a national security threat. He was interacting with the public via social media on Thursday. Here's a report by Salam Amenya. The Bank of Ghana has since August 2017 closed down 420 financial institutions in the country. This, he maintained, is a national security threat. While this development may appear as a threat to only the businesses that have been shut down, it is in fact a threat to our national security. Indeed, as has been widely touted, ownership of capital matters. The ethnicity of capital is real and the banking sector and financial system of a country are part of its national security architecture. He said about 20,000 direct jobs have been lost because of the financial sector cleanup. The number could be even higher when you take into account the indirect job losses occasioned by this crisis. Apart from the livelihoods lost, the resolution costs of nearly 20 billion Ghana cities, as we are told, ultimately becomes a burden on the Ghanaian taxpayer. Government in January worked with an advisor and selected pension funds to structure a special purpose vehicle, the Ghana Amalgamated Trust, to support solvent and well-run indigenous banks, which were having difficulties in meeting the new minimum requirements deadline. President Mahama insists the financial sector cleanup could have been handled better, demanding government reveals shareholders behind the Ghana Amalgamated Trust. It is tried knowledge that no bank or financial institution, no matter how big, can survive if there is a rush on investments, especially when induced by the pronouncements of policymakers or regulators. While at it, we call on the Akufuado administration to lift the veil on the beneficial shareholders of the Ghana Amalgamated Trust and to curb its supposed predatory bailout assaults on the remaining banks, which include state-owned banks. 
Reacting to questions from the public, John Mahama revealed he will merge some ministries and drastically cut down the size of government if the NDC regains power. And if you consider 40 ministers and you take some of the portfolios, procurement, you have a procurement minister, you have monetary and evaluation, you have planning, when there's a whole National Development Planning Commission, you know, you have aviation railways, which could all have been submerged into transport. I mean, so there are things that we will do. I mean, if I become president again, I'll imagine, merge all these ministries. Sanitation will go back to local government. I believe that can be handled there. You know, aviation and railways will go back into transport. As for business development, procurement, and all those other uh, ministries, they will just be scrapped completely. Right, uh, let's get on to the telephone lines and speak with the uh, uh, Dean of Business School at the University of uh, Cape Coast, Professor John Gachi, uh, joins us now. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you. We're grateful for your time. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. If you can hear me. Hello. Yes, sir. Thank yes, you sir, very much you. Uh, for your time. Uh, quickly, I want to find out from you, in your view, what you think the, the call for unveiling the stakeholders of the special purpose vehicle would achieve, really? Well, I think it will achieve... Uh Right, uh, Professor John Gachi, I do hope that we still have him on the telephone lines. This is News at 10, live from the News Hub at Adesawe Kanda in Accra. We're trying to get uh, through to Professor John Gachi so we can have, the community, we can have some uh, discussions on uh, former President John Mahama's call for government to disclose the shareholders uh, behind the special purpose vehicle, the Amalgamated Trust. Uh, so, Professor Gachi, you were saying that uh, this is necessary and that it will achieve some, some purposes. Hello, sir. Right, uh, we apologize uh, for the difficulty in getting through to uh, Professor John Gachi. Let's see for the last time if we have him on so we can continue the discussion. Good evening, sir. Thank you very much. So I was asking uh, whether you get the sense that the suggestion by former President John Mahama to disclose the shareholders behind the special yeah. purpose vehicle is relevant. You say it is and it will Hello? achieve. Yeah, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so you were saying that this is important and it, it will achieve some purpose. Yeah, I think it should just uh, uh, give clarity. Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Yes, sir. Uh, so, yeah, you're, 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 you're saying something. Sorry, uh, we're losing you back and forth. It's, it's just supposed to provide disclosure, clarity. And it's part of our good governance we're talking about, especially when the card seems to. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Yeah. Especially when the card comes with a lot of uh, misunderstanding as uh, regarding the requirement of the of, of at nine thirty, uh, you will realize that in at 9.30, Section 9D, it is very clear that you cannot use borrowed funds to capitalize a bank. Uh, so if you are now going to use a borrowed fund to capitalize a bank, we would need to look at those who are behind. Of course, it was very clear from the beginning that it is supposed to be a public corporation, a public corporation which also meant that that should have gone under Article 192 of the Constitution, which says that no public corporation shall be established except by an act of parliament. So because of all these uh, uh, misunderstandings and breaches in legal requirements, you will need to now know us at now who are the real people behind uh, this entity that was created, which was supposed to take about 70% of... Uh, uh, equity interest in uh, those financial institutions and at the same time take some additional uh, 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 equity in the form of preferences which actually entangle the existence of those uh, uh, banks that have been uh, captured under right. 
uh, 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 the agreement. Right. So I think if we are not careful and we are not able to disclose those who are behind, then the state will just be generating funds for people that we are not aware of. Mm, but is this to the, suggest, really, that the shareholders yeah. are into this uh, to make money off the efforts of these banks or that perhaps they are keenly interested in resuscitating them as the purpose is? Well, well, I think the public is, uh, should, should be aware that the structure is that by 31st of uh, March 2019, GAT is supposed to recapitalize those banks that have been mentioned. But as we speak, that recapitalization has not taken place, which also means that they are breaching the requirement of Bank of Ghana. But Bank of Ghana is not bold enough to go ahead to withdraw their license as done to banks that were not able to meet the minimum capital by 31st December 2018. So you can also see that we are using the GATT to actually entrench discrimination against some local banks. So, so that is why we need more clarity about this. Now, again, as of July, it was not clear whether GATT start, uh, 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 actually did any uh, uh, invest, uh, uh, re, uh, uh, actually provided any money to the banks which were captured under that, uh, uh, that provision, which means the asset now we have not been able to raise the money that is required for that purpose. So it's like we are using two regulations. Right. One for the banks that were captured at the first instance, and the one for the bank capture under those that should benefit from uh, from that, which I think is not the best. Right. Uh, Professor John Gachi, we're grateful for your time. Thank you extremely. Uh, Professor John Gachi is a dean of business school at the University of Cape Coast. I'm Stephen Antti. This is News at 10, live from the News Hub. You can also catch us on your DSTV channel 279. We'll be right back with more news. Don't go away. Welcome back. Now, the expose by freelance journalist, freelance investigative journalist Manasi Azore Awene revealed that a company incorporated in June of 2017, Talent Discovery Limited, TDL, won a number of government contracts through restrictive tendering. The documentary dubbed Contracts for Sale also revealed that the company was allegedly engaged in selling contracts. An encounter with the general manager of the Talent Discovery Limited, Thomas Amor, revealed that TDL sold road contracts to Kedra Enterprise, a fake company Manasi used for the investigation at a cost of 22.3 million CDs. However, CEO of the Public Procurement Authority, ABAJ, who is said to be a shareholder of the company, denied knowing anything about the sale of contracts by TDL. Upon further probing, ABAJ told Manasse that Talent Discovery Limited was for his cousin, but later said it was rather for his brother-in-law. Meanwhile, the Director of Communications at the Jubilee House, Eugene Ahin, says the swift response from the President is an indication that he is committed to pursuing this matter to its logical conclusion. He spoke uh, in an earlier interview with TV3. Almost every single allegation that is made against an appointee of the president, at least he moves swiftly to make sure those, invest those allegations are quickly investigated by the relevant institutions of states. Um, this is just one example of what the president has been doing since he got into office. Every single um, allegation of corruption or allegation of conflict of interest or any, 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 any allegation whatsoever that's leveled against any appointee of office, he moves quickly to make sure those, invest those allegations are quickly investigated, and that's the same thing he's done in this matter. Um, uh right, uh, let's get back to the studio and speak with the Ghana Institute of Procurement. Uh, the president is here, Mr. Collins. Uh, Sapong. How are you, sir? I'm good. Anyway. So I know that uh, this revelation coming from yesterday and today and the action by the presidency all sends all sorts of signals. Uh, from your association's standpoint, what do you make of the development? Well, um, um, we all 
woke up this morning to the news. Some of the members saw the video. That was yesterday. Some of us had opportunity to watch it this morning. So today, um, the executives, the council members, and our ethics and um, professional standard committee we were in a meeting since around three o'clock, and uh, we had a press release just around seven. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, looking at it um, from the institute standpoint, there's a lot of alleged infractions when it comes to our ethics and of the practice and also some of the um, um, sections within the procurement law. So there was the need for us mm. to respond. respond. So we agreed that the way it is, and he is a member of our, our institute. A member in good standing. A good standing, a fellow as such, a senior member. So now in our constitution, when something like that happens, then there's the need to afford that person the opportunity to be invited so that they will also state their case. Mm -hmm. When they are coming, they have the opportunity to come with a lawyer, a friend, or anybody that they believe they can trust them. So we have given that opportunity to him, and a letter will be sent, mm -hmm. hopefully latest by Monday, uh, to him, inviting him to that committee. So we will also take him through whatever uh, investigation we have as mm. enshrined in our constitution. I know that it will, be, that it will be too soon for you to pass any form of judgment, judgment on him yeah. uh, yes, since yes. you haven't heard from him. But we are curious, I mean, from what you saw in the documentary and the alleged breaches that uh, were exhibited, you think this is a very pretty bad case? Well, if, if whatever is in it, uh, when we, we question him and what we saw is really the case, then in terms of somebody will say technically you can't really pin him, but when it comes to the ethics of the profession, uh, it marks that uh, he's using his authority to profit himself which is an ethical issue in our constitution. So looking at it, if it proves out that that is the issue, then maybe uh, some sanctions mm. will be meted Tell out me to some you. of the uh, sanctions that usually are meted out to people who violate your ethical uh, regulations or rules. Okay. One of them, he can be debarred or he will be suspended. Mm as a member of the institute and can also be given a dismissal where he wouldn't get the opportunity to be a member. Ever again? Ever again. Mm -hmm. So, and um, now we are now talking of uh, licensing ourselves. So we are even calling on the president to help us pass a practicing law because as it is now, we do not have a practicing law where members are given licenses to practice. So now all that we can do is to, let's say, take him out of the institute and it's already in the public domain. Mm. So mm. everybody knows so, what so is there. So if I understand but, you correctly, I mean, you as an association, it's more like a voluntary association uh, which helps professionals in procurement uh, better themselves and be in good standing. But you are thinking that if there is a law that uh, ensures that you get a license to practice, to then practice. punitive measures can be yes. well and better so enforced. When, when things like this happen and we go through our investigation and everything uh, uh, directs that, look, this person need to be debarred. Your and license, your license can be will taken be from taken you, away where from it you. means that you can never be a procurement officer or superintend over any procurement department. But let's look at, let's look at procurement and the whole, the fact is that uh, the procurement now has been, is seen to have been giving a more, um, 
has been giving more prominence and priority in this government with the appointment of procurement minister, yeah. the National Procurement Authority. The essence of all of these rules and regulations and procedures that have been followed by this government and successive governments is to streamline our procurement processes. But when, I, when we hear things like these, we wonder whether the reform in procurement has yielded any results at all. Are you not embarrassed that procurement is going down the drain from uh, the angle of this, uh, this investigative report and others that have come out? I, I will say that um, in the past, people were not even hearing procurement. People mm -hmm. even thought procurement wasn't a profession mm -hmm. that people can practice and live on. So some of these things... The, the procurement law came in, we have the procurement minister, and you have the public procurement authority. Now people, there, there's that focus on that area. And the reason why is now in, 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 in everybody is talking about it is every organization, like I keep say, saying, and it's been researched, 70% of whatever every organization spend goes into uh, procurement. Apart from your salaries and everything, your cameras, your chairs, everything is bought. So if you if you procure well, and you you reduce costs during your procurement, it's process, better for your own. It's company. better for your own company. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the government. So now the focus is there, and mm -hmm. that's why we're calling for that uh, regulation so that it's properly regulated, so that the necessary. Revenue, the savings, right. the cost reduction that this function brings to the table can be taken advantage of. All right. Uh, we're grateful for your time, uh, Mr. Edgeman Sapon, for coming. I'm Stephen Enti. This is still uh, News at 10 live from the News Hub at uh, Disawe Kanda in a crowd. We have more news for you. Right. Uh, let's. Uh, Right, uh, let's now go to Crowell constituency where two aspirants are contesting the party's primaries there. Frederick Clarence Williams has visited the constituency to gauge the mood there. The Crowell constituency in the greater Accra region is inhabited by lower, middle and upper class citizens. It has a population of about 350,000. The constituency has challenges poor road network, and lack of jobs. After the NDC held their seat for eight years, the NPP snatched it in the 2016 polls. The trend of the constituency shows that no MP wins the seat a second time. Statistics show that a parliamentary seat is predominantly won by the NDC, but the presidential votes do not favor the party that wins the parliamentary seat. Two aspirants have so far failed to contest the NDC parliamentary primaries in the Crowell constituency. According to Nick Paco, a youth activist, the people of Crowell need a young man and a first-timer to lead the party to take back the parliamentary seat from the ruling New Patriotic Party. We need people who have what it takes to bring everybody together to be able to make Crowell an attractive party to be able to make Crowell united front to be able to win a seat. Nobody wins Crowell seats if the person is not a new face. People who normally contest for the first time wins the seat. But Agnes Na Momolai is quick to dismiss the comment by his closest contender that electing a first time candidate would do the trick for the party in 2020. The only person who has broken the record did not come in once and win. And that is Honorable Dr. Okilekwe Kuma. Doctor came in twice before he won. And when he won to, he broke the record of Ayashi Enyo, meaning that you cannot take the seat twice. So how then do you say that the people who come in immediately win? Agnes Na Momolai, however, insists he is not known in the area. It's not something that you say, um, I cannot win the seat. If you want to contest, you could say uh, such a thing. But then, when it comes to the reality on the grounds, and I'm sure he goes to places where people tell him that they don't know him, because you need to have a good track record with the people in the party for them to accept you, and then the whole constituency accepts you. Neil Pakpo believed the party needs a unifier 
to win the seat back. We need the people who have the strength to move from house to house, room to room, kitchen to kitchen, door to door, to be able to execute an effective campaign and also a heart that unites their attitude and character that is inbuilt. If you don't have united heart, we can't win Kuro because even when it is given to us on a silver platter with a divided front, we will still lose that. So, the question is, who have what it takes to bring people together? The primaries is slated for August 24, 2019. I like the woman's expression. She says, I are you. Uh, that's interesting. Well, that's how we wrap up with News at 10. Thanks very much for your time. And we have the crew. Good night. There is more news at 3news.com.